Hi there. Before we jump into today's episode, I wanted to make a quick plug for our upcoming peer-to-peer professional forum conference in Philadelphia, February 21st through the 23rd. If you have been enjoying this podcast, you won't want to miss out. This conference is your opportunity to be a part of conversations just like the one you're about to hear with your peers tackling the topics that most impact your work and your organization. The conference includes interactive workshops and breakouts, inspiring keynote speakers, and networking opportunities to help you build a professional community that can sustain you year round. For all the details, Head on over to our website at peertopeerforum.com. And as a special incentive for our podcast listeners, you can use the code SOAPBOX, all one word, during registration for an extra $50 off between now and January 31st. See you in Philly. Welcome back. To the P2P Soapbox. I'm your host and P2P BFF, Marcy Maxwell, and I am thrilled to bring you today's super fun episode. I always love to ask people, what's the best event you've ever attended and why? Was it your best friend's wedding because you knew literally everyone there? Was it a baby shower because everyone was there for the same reason, to help the new parents prepare for this next chapter in their life? Or like me, was it an amazing concert because the community had taken on a life of its own with costumes and friendship bracelets and dancing? The Taylor Swift Eras Tour? Or is that just me? Best event ever? Anyway, most of the time, a person's favorite event has nothing to do with the location or the food or the swag. It all boils down to the community. A group of like-minded people coming together to celebrate or accomplish or support a common cause, which means without a focus on building an authentic and inclusive community, our walks and runs and rides risk blending together. To discuss this very topic, we are so lucky to be joined by Tracy Evans, Race Director of the AIDS Life Cycle, which if you're not familiar, is a fully supported seven-day bike ride from San Francisco to Los Angeles, raising money for both the Los Angeles LGBT Center and the San Francisco AIDS Foundation. As Tracy describes it, it is a life-changing ride, not a race, through some of California's most beautiful countryside, all in support of the two nonprofits' shared interest in reducing new HIV infections and improving the quality of life for people living with HIV. AIDS Life Cycle was also recognized as the 2023 Program of the Year at the last Peer-to-Peer Professional Forum Conference. And now for a quick little bit about Tracy. She joined the AIDS Lifecycle team in 2017 after launching her nonprofit career at the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society and the Lupus Foundation of America. During our conversation, Tracy shares insights into how her team has cultivated one of the industry's largest event personalities. She'll share stories from the 545-mile trip and behind-the-scenes efforts that make their cyclist community thrive, not only during the event itself, but also throughout the year. Tracy also discusses the intentional steps that her team has taken to foster inclusivity and how she manages to support her team during a literal event on wheels. This is a really great episode, so let's jump right in. Here's my conversation with AIDS Life Cycles' Tracy Evans. Tracy, welcome to the podcast. We're so excited to have you. Oh, hey, Marcy. It's good to see you. Good to talk with you. I'm excited to be here. Excited to have you. Excited to have you. You were one of the first ones on my list when I knew we wanted to do this podcast. So I know I shared a little bit about your bio in my introduction, but I want to hear it from you. So can you just tell everybody a little bit about your professional, your personal journey that led you to this current role as the ride director of the AIDS life cycle? And tell us about the events that you work on. About 20 years ago, I made a big change in my life, but I'm going to go back a little further than that. I was working um, in the for-profit world. Um, My last for-profit gig was at DHL Worldwide Express. I was in marketing and I managed a really interesting thing in marketing for DHL, which was lead management. And 
I helped build and then sustain this lead management flow process that got leads, about a million leads a year, to the right sales force. That doesn't sound like anything we do at all, does it? Not at all. Fundraising. <laughs> um, and in 1997, I did my first marathon and I did my first marathon with team and training. And like many of us, I fell in love with the magic that happened at this event and through raising money that I never even imagined I could uh, raise. And from there, I got really involved with team and training. I was a, a coach and a mentor, and I did a bunch of volunteer type of things. And so fast forward to 2002, DHL was um, moving the U.S. headquarters from San Francisco to the East Coast. And I had a really, I had a really terrific and unique opportunity that I had a year notice that my job was moving to the East Coast. I did not want to go. But if I stayed until the end, I had a really nice severance package. So my intention was stay until the end and then figure it out. And somehow in there, along the way, I was at the Honolulu Marathon coaching for team and training. And one of the staff members asked me what I was going to do when my job ended. And I said, well, I don't know. But if I could do anything in the whole wide world, I would love to work at team and training. And I would love to be the director of the San Francisco chapter team and training program for San Francisco LLS chapter, um, managing or running the team and training program. But the person who's in that role will never leave. So, you know, whatever. Well, what I didn't know was that person had resigned the week before. And <laughs> the rest was just kismet. And I became the director of team and training for San Francisco Bay Area chapter, which at that time was the largest uh, program in the country for team and training. I had great success there. I thought it would be a two-year gig. I thought I would go do, be a do-gooder for two years and then hop back over uh, to my corporate life. Well, I did make a change in two years, and that's when I joined the national staff for team and training and um, was on the national staff for 11 years. Um, my last role there was uh, national, one, of the, one of the two national directors for team and training, and I was really kind of the product manager, if you will. Um, and did a lot of work with a lot of different events. So that was that. Um, I took a little journey over to the Lupus Foundation as a national director of development, working really on bringing to life third-party peer-to-peer fundraising events for the foundation. And then um, we had some life changes that happened. We had moved out of state of California and we're moving back. And I was really looking for that top job and something in community. All I knew was, here's what I put into the universe at that time. I want something in community. And a former colleague of mine was sending me um, VP and ED jobs. And she sent over this one. She said, I'm not sure if this is what you're looking for, but take a read. Well, it was the ride director for AIDS life cycle. So I grew up in Southern California. I've lived in Northern California most of my adult life. I um, love bikes. My wife and I, that is our primary activity is bikes of all kinds. Um, we are part of the LGBT commu community. And this job is complex in that it serves two organizations. I'll talk about that in a moment. It was like everything about it was exactly what I said. Community, pick one. It crossed every line. So uh, I wrote back to her and I said, you know, when I read this job profile, um, it has my name on it. <laughs> Next thing you know, here I was. So, so AIDS Life Cycle. AIDS Life Cycle is really an amazing event. Um, we are going into our 30th year of existence. Um, the ride started as the California AIDS Ride in 1994. And um, it is an event that is really unique in the space because the event is co-owned by two separate 501c3s, the Los Angeles LGBT Center and San Francisco AIDS Foundation. So we have um, full-time staff in both agencies, but that work for the ride as a whole. So it's it's a very interesting from a from a, a complex business type of yeah. perspective. It's very interesting for me. I am never lacking for interesting problems to solve and build on. Um, so and so, what is AIDS life cycle like? That's the interesting side. What's even more interesting is that. We are a seven-day, 545-mile bike ride from San Francisco to Los Angeles. Um, this year, we raised about $12 million. But 
and I'll, I can talk more about that uh, later, but um, last year was our largest year ever. We raised $18 million. We generally have about 22, 2300 cyclists, 600 roadies who come along for this week long experience that is um, magical and mystical and um, saves lives and does all kinds of great work. So that's, that's AIDS Life Cycle and that's me. I love it. Well, we're recording this at the end of June and you just came off of your 2023 event. And I know I love following along on social media and seeing the photos, the videos, and it just always seems like it is one of the industry's biggest event personalities, kind of has a whole life of its own, this community. And so how does that come to be? And how does your team foster that within this large group of riders, you know, how do you weave that personality into, you know, your communication, your round, your stewardship, your recruitment? That I think is one of the things that is so fascinating about your event. I, I think inside of that question, you asked about 27. So um, <laughs> let me start with... I'm still new first... at this, Tracy. <laughs> You're doing great, Marcy. You're doing great. <laughs> um, so the event is... It's a spectacle. So we'll start there. Um, and there are many things that happen throughout the event that have evolved and grown and, and come to be over the years. Almost all of them rooted in the community doing something. A couple of examples of that are and probably the biggest one is day five of the ride. It's our shortest day. It's about a 54 mile route that day. Um, and it's also called Red Dress Day. So Red Dress Day started many years ago. Um, that particular day, we go on a road called Lompoc Cosmelia Road, and it's a big road with switchbacks. And the idea back in the day was they called it Dress in Red Day. And we wanted to, or the community at that time, wanted to emulate the AIDS ribbon going mm. through these beautiful switchbacks. And it evolved because we are a sassy bunch of folks. Um, it evolved over time to become Red Dress Day instead of Dress in Red Day. And so it is a day where people just get incredibly creative and wacky. And um, we had a guy on the ride this year, James. And um, James brought, it was James and the Giant Fro. I don't know if you saw these pictures, but he took red netting and he, he took a second helmet, <laughs> basically. And he glued this netting and it had to be the circumference. I can't even tell you. It stuck out like four feet. Just we called him James and the Giant Fro. I had to actually make him tie it back <laughs> um, to ride because there was no way he could look over his shoulder. I know so, he's probably blocking and, the view. Yeah, and you know there are there's a, a great participant, Robert Kwan, who is a physician, and he he's a really well respected physician here in the Bay Area. And every year he commissions a gown to be made. And he wears like drag queen shoes with a bike cleat. Um, it it is it's the craziest thing. It's it's become a tradition. The teams really get into it. This year we had um you in the past we've always had teams with Tina uh, the Tina Turners. Nobody did Tina Turner this year. I was really surprised. But we did have um we did have Tanya from White Lotus um was one of one of the teams was Tanya from the White Lotus gone wrong it was really oh my funny gosh. Um, we had one team that was strawberries and they had these really cute strawberry costumes and when they would get to rest stops they would all like pop down and put the the strawberries over their knee and just sit like on the ground crouch like little strawberries in the field because we ride through a lot of strawberry fields on the ride it was really cute like people just get super creative and have fun um so there's an example of like this whole thing and how we bring the spirit of just joy to life. We, um, so you asked also like, how do we, how do we manage those things or, yeah. or cultivate them? And, um, our team is, is rooted in engagement. I think that's a big buzzword for a lot of places in the last year, but we have our community engagement team, which is nine people who really have regions, mostly in California, but also we have two out-of-state engagement reps who um, they are responsible for building community in their region. They work with our cyclists. They um, 
they hold local social events, they go to training rides in those areas. They're really there to help the community kind of build and gel and help those communities um, have their own identities. And I'm thinking of right now, Palm Springs, we've been growing. A lot of folks have moved to Palm Springs during the pandemic. We already had a lot of folks who come from Palm Springs. And so there's a team out there called the Desert Roadrunners. And, you know, how they brought the Desert Roadrunners to life the week of the ride was really fun and cute. And so there's all these different people and and places just bringing joy and love and um, energy to the ride. So um, we do it through community engagement throughout the year. And then we have um, our digital engagement team is really strong and terrific. And you saw a lot this year from the ride because they were they were doing a fantastic job yeah. getting imagery out there and really sharing the experience and making people want to be part of the fun. What all of this comes to is it's fun, but the reason it's fun is that it is a week of the year that everyone who's part of AIDS life cycle, you could be gay, you could be straight, um, you could be male, you could be female, you could be trans, you could be non-binary. It's a week where everybody just gets to be themselves. Mm -hmm. Nobody has to have their guard up. Nobody has to be thinking, oh, I can't be my authentic self. And when you share a space for seven days, that is freedom from your everyday life. It is magic. And I think that's, that is like, we can't, we can't, turn that on or off, right? right? That's just part of the magic of what people call AIDS life cycle, which is the love bubble. Like this is a place where everyone's welcome and everyone's part of a thing and we celebrate everyone every day. I can totally see that. And I imagine cultivating on social media and bringing that experience to life then also makes somebody maybe who's brand new, they have something to build their expectations on so they don't walk into it blind. And I'm sure it also creates this, a good version of like one up in culture of like, well, I saw what they oh. did last year. How do we do it? It honestly reminds me of Taylor Swift's Eras tour, which, <laughs> you know, if anybody's listening, I, I'm, I'm a big fan, but it social media, how it spawned. Oh, well, we have to do this better than the last city. I need the better costume since then. And it's just this perpetual state of I want to be a part of this big, joyful community because I saw it on social media and now I get to be a part of it. And yeah. I think that's every week and this is every year, but I'm sure it it's very organic, but it's, there's things that you can do, like really. Right. There's up structure, things. there's structure, right? There is, exactly. we, we, and, and we set the tone. I think, you know, we're really, we're really serious about safety. Yeah. We're really serious about riding bikes 545 miles. It's amazing how many people who do AIDS life cycle who ride EFI, if you know, you know, if they ride every inch, right? Uh -huh. 545 miles, but they don't think of themselves as athletes. Right. I, I find it super fascinating. Um, but we set the tone. And when people arrive for what we call orientation day, so it's a seven day event, but it's really eight days because you come to orientation day, you check in. And everybody has to sit through a safety meeting. Well, our safety meeting is we have a video that is about safety, but it is not your mother's safety video. <laughs> <laughs> there are all kinds of irreverent, funny, um, silly things. But we built this video in the spirit of AIDS life cycle in the spirit of wonderful and beautiful culture of the community to get people's attention. You know, mm -hmm. when we're talking about I, an example of that is there is a demonstration of you must stop at every stop sign, which by the way, is hard to do on a bike sometimes. And there's a lot of stop signs in 545 miles. So there's a cyclist who comes to a full and complete stop and through the through the crosswalk comes a bunch of drag queens dancing across the street. Like, <laughs> you know, we, we, we want to save the, or protect these folks, right? We don't want to ride through and hit somebody. So the, um, you know, we set the tone of the whole week in that meeting uh, with, with a little bit of fun and sass when we're talking about really serious topics, because it all comes together to be this joyful week, but it's really about 
saving lives and changing lives and helping the clients of our two agencies. And oh, by the way, as a community, building strength in a community that has traditionally been outsiders and traditionally Mm -hmm. has not been accepted and traditionally cannot be their authentic selves all week long. So there are a lot of layers to what we do. You know, we talk about this again, sitting here as an outsider, it can feel like this ride is for a niche kind of audience. You said it's people who it's all kinds of different writers, men, women, transgender, non-binary, black, white. It can seem like you have to be a part of a certain group to join this, like that it's a very niche audience. But obviously, as you've said, you've done a lot of really intentional things to make this event as inclusive as possible beyond just making it inclusive for people who are LGBTQ. It's inclusive in lots of different ways. So can you talk to me about how you've how y'all have worked to make that of this event as inclusive as possible, you know, your successes, your challenges? That's a great question, Marcy. I think uh, over the last seven years that I've been here, we've definitely seen an evolution in the mission and our work with the ride has always been to be inclusive. And I think what's changed for us internally is being intentional about how we're building that. Um, we about seven years ago, and it may have been a little bit right before I started, we started um, a group, a Facebook group called the Women of AIDS Life Cycle. So traditionally, AIDS Life Cycle is about 75% men, about 24% women, about 1% trans and non-binary. And we've all, there's always been a lot of pressure to grow (laughs) the percentage of women um, and, you know, we, my goal is I, I, I just want people to come into the event and I want them to feel like they belong here. So intentionality, um, women of AIDS life cycle, which in, um, some of our markets turned into monthly training rides for the women of AIDS life cycle. So, um, for me, it's really fun and interesting to go on a training ride that is for and about women. And this is nothing, this is not disparaging our male counterparts. Y'all are awesome. Um, But there's something different in the energy. There's something different in the approach. And there's different conversation that can happen um, Mm -hmm. when you're going to go ride 50 miles with a a bunch of women. So that started several years ago. Um, Over the years, we've started different, we started different steering committees that included um, growing our BIPOC community. and. Uh, I would in 2019, we started a steering committee, the BIPOC steering committee, which was really meant to help us focus and grow and engage um, uh, the BIPOC community. That year, we also started um, our trans working group, which is now a gender expansive working group to make sure that and that I actually I want to talk about that one the most because I think it's really interesting we are cohabitating for seven days together and Mm -hmm. folks in the um, gender expansive group have some needs that are really particular. Um, One is we have shower trucks, right? So people take showers Mm -hmm. throughout the week. We had to get an understanding of what would be and would not be great experience for our gender expansive folks. Additionally, you know, a lot of people now these days are, um, talking about preferred pronouns. And we do that and we actually provide stickers for people to use. And, you know, we're, we have this really interesting place because our, both of our agencies are at the core of the work in not just ending AIDS, but in broad social services of the Mm -hmm. LGBTQ community. And we're here to uplift the community. So we we're doing those types of things. I think a lot of folks will say, oh, yeah, well, we make sure that we show diversity on a poster. Well, that's great, but you've got to be living the what what's on the poster, right? Mm-hmm. And so one of the things that I, I, I come back to intentionality and reality. So I don't I, I don't want to have a poster that represents something that isn't what people will experience on the ride. Right. And I think that that's as equally as important as us getting in and and doing things where we're inviting the community to part, be part of how, how do we build how do we build our the black contingent on the ride well mm-hmm. and and why do we want to so i think there's a 
this connection of why do we want to? It's not just because we want to be good citizens of the world and, right. and do the right things. Our mission right now is rooted in lifting up the BIPOC community and getting into and helping reduce stigma, helping reduce or improve health outcomes um, for, I mean, men who have sex with men in the Black community have a really high, can have a really high incidence of HIV AIDS because of a lot of communal Mm -hmm. factors. So we're here as part of that mission to help like break barriers and help break stigma and help do a lot of things. One of our teams in Northern California is called We Spoke. They used to be called She Spoke and it was a women's team. And they decided they wanted to be more gender expansive. So they changed it to We Spoke. And the team captain a couple of months ago said, hey, we really want to represent the work of San Francisco AIDS Foundation that is about women living with HIV, AIDS, and preventing HIV, AIDS. Well, there is a program specific at the foundation. I connected the team captain with the woman who runs this program. Well, it, the, and the program is called HUES and H-U-E-S. And so on Red Dress Day, the um, We Spoke team all was dressed in red and they were all wearing shirts that said, that had painted on them, ask me about HUES. Now we have, look, check this out. I just got goosebumps. Check this out. We have a team of really badass folks who are riding their 545 mile ride They got all kinds of information and education from Ebony at the foundation about um, how to help lift up Black women specifically. This program is aimed at Black women and women of color. Um, And they're now educating the other people on the ride about this program. That's great. I mean, these are the kinds of things that happen at AIDS Life Cycle. Like people are so enthusiastic about the work that they want to help. And like they integrate it in their red breast outfit. I mean, they could have just worn a red tutu, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, it just, it also calls back to, you know, I often think about a lot of peer to peer fundraising events started not as fundraisers, but as a way to get a community together who's all going through something similar, right? Whether it's a cancer diagnosis exactly. or exactly. a child with the disease or, you know, LGBTQ, you know, where they're fighting for different rights. And, you're still achieving that, creating this community where people want to be together while also being a large fundraiser that can help further the mission beyond that single day. And I love what you said about, you know, it's one thing to make your marketing inclusive, right? Mm -hmm. But how often do you make your marketing inclusive? And then those very people you were trying to attract they show up and there's nobody else there that looks like them. I even, it reminds me of one of the organizations where I worked, it was the the launch of, we wanted everything that we did to be in English and in Spanish, all of our marketing materials. Uh, I know exactly where you're going. And it became the big question of, yes, that's a good thing to do, but are we set up to where when there are Spanish only speakers showing up at our event, are we going to have are we going to have presenters and MCs and signage and music that then makes them feel included? And so, yes, we want to do it, but we we can't do it until we know we're going to also be offering an experience exactly. that works for them. Exactly. And so I think sometimes that gets lost, right? People mm-hmm. think, I want to make this look inclusive. And, you know, it's the field of dreams. If we build it, they will come. You know, if we show it on a marketing poster, surely people will show up, but they might show up and then have a really bad experience because it was a little bit of a bait and switch. You have to be always in learning mode, always in learning mode. Um, because this this work, the inc- work of inclusion will never be done. And you can't say, oh, we could did that really well. Yeah, yes. Yeah, actually, it's like, okay, What can we do better? And you have to include the community. I think one of the, one of the great lessons you were talking about Spanish speaking that I think that question has come to me so many times. I'm like, unless and until we can actually have full service in Spanish, can't do it. We do. I am, I'm really happy about, um, we have a team called Team Flying Hands. They're a deaf team and it's a deaf crew of cyclists. And we have, we actually 
are able to, um, we have roadies who come on who are ASL interpreters. And this year, it's like every year, like, how can we take it up a notch? And this year, one of our media ambassadors was one of our deaf participants. In fact, Uriel, who is the team captain of Team Flying Hands. Um, so when there were media opportunities, we needed to dispatch one of the ASL interpreters mm-hmm. to be there to work. But I mean, it, the, you have to be prepared and able to yep. do that, right? Last year on the ride, 2022, we our um, BIPOC community reached out and said, hey, is it cool? Can we get one of the photographers to do a group photo of the BIPOC community on night six? And we're like, great, sure, love it. And then it was like, oh, that's such a great idea. We did it and people loved it so much. So this year we actually built into our programming schedule a BIPOC photo, a women of AIDS life cycle photo, and a gender expansive group photo. And again, it's like, oh, we got it more right this year. There's still people Mm -hmm. who didn't know and still people who didn't get there and were disappointed afterwards. But it's like not about the photo. The photo is great. What it was about and what it is about is helping folks find community. And, you know, a lot of people come to AIDS Lifecycle on a team, but there are a lot of people who come as solo riders. And this is an opportunity for people to meet part of their intersectionality, right? To meet other people who look like them, who may have similar or may have different challenges, but we're all about community building. So any way we can do that through this experience is great. When we look at how how are we saying we want to, you know, grow this community or that group community, the largest population in Southern California in the Los Angeles area of uh, people of color is Latino, mm-hmm. Latinx community. And we have grown significantly. In fact, uh, 22% of our cyclists this year identify within the Latinx realm. And that is mm-hmm. very broad. What what does that mean, yeah. right? Um, you might have Mexican heritage, you might have Spanish heritage, like there yeah. and everything uh beyond. That is a lot of people. 22% of our mm-hmm. um ride this year identifies as Latinx. Now, let's talk about intentionality. Several years ago, we grew the diversity of our staff. And we have key staff people who are part of different communities. When we're hiring, we're looking to represent the community and build the community and represent the mission and build the mission. So um, we have several um, Latinx identifying folks on our staff. And I would say that when we bring people in that are from the AIDS lifecycle community who are helping us, who are part of the diversity of the ride, um, there, there's a great opportunity there for them to represent to the community externally. When you, when you, anyone listening to this is trying to build diversity within your event, you know, what does your team look like? What 100%. Is, and, and how are you moving in the community? And yeah. are you moving into parts of the community that you are, um, that, that you have relationship with? Because, yep. you know, here I am. So I am a white queer woman of a certain age. Um, and I move in a lot of communities, but there's also a lot of communities that I can move in, but are not my community. Exactly. And so I like that. It's just how it is. That could be a whole nother podcast topic, but I think that's where a lot of, a lot of organizations, I think that's one thing they get wrong with their DEI strategy is they don't always realize that having a staff that first and foremost reflects the community is is the first step. It is not the set. It's not the third or fourth down the road. It's starting with your staff. And I think we've talked about, you know, that's a, unfortunately it feels like a challenge in the peer to peer community. Cause I don't think there has been enough intentionality in recruiting, you know, BIPOC employees into the world of peer to peer and stewarding and coaching and promoting them up the ranks. As you right. see, I mean, we've talked about, you know, our our community is is still very white. Um, mm-hmm. and it's not for for lack of desire to bring in other voices to the table. It's quite simply, this is going to have to be something that as an industry, 
we have to commit to and we have to make some have some conversations about what does this look like across the board so that we Mm -hmm. can create a more inclusive and a more diverse community of fundraisers. And it's not a problem we've solved yet by any means. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So speaking of staff. So again, you've got this event with this big personality, which is a lot to manage on its own, a, a very intentionally diverse and inclusive event. And it is also an event on wheels, which I'm sure is not the faint part for your event planners, right? That there's a lot of people out there that think they are the most savvy event person, but that is a little bit terrifying. So how do you work with your team, you know, and your volunteers and your leadership? Like, how do you make this happen so smoothly? What's kind of your leadership approach to this eight days, 545 miles? trek across the state so i'm really fortunate um in i I am someone said to me on the ride i'm too blessed to be stressed and i feel like oh that's a very southern phrase is that a very oh my gosh i'm coming to you from tennessee that's a very there's lots of lots of women that have that on t-shirts down here well i am too blessed to be stressed and um, but i feel really really fortunate and grateful um that I I have a pretty good sized team. Um, and I will also say we produce the ride in house. So the the our team is is building the whole thing. Um about mm, roughly speaking, about a third of my team is the production staff, about a third of my team is fundraisers, and about a third of my team is marketing, digital engagement, administration, technology. We have an 18 month cycle for the ride. We start in January, like we will start in January of 24 for the 2025 event. And, um, there, so first of all, I'll let you all sit with that because not a lot of us have an 18 month, uh, time horizon for one event. We should. Um, <laughs> we don't always, but no, we, we should. don't always. Um, so 18 months time horizon for the event. And then it, it, and that's just to get to the event and on event. And then it takes another three months to down to wrap up the event. So there's that, um, throughout that time, there are different points of inclusion for our staff and then for our key volunteers. We have events that happen throughout the year, special events that are meant for community engagement. We have holiday party in our major markets. That's a big produced event. We have kickoff rides in October that are um, dispersed and they're they're run by volunteers who run training rides throughout the year, but it's kind of a point in time to get started. Um, we have an art expo, which happens in late January, early February, separate from the event. So our community partners have a showcase and people can get what they need to be successful. And then we do a one day cycling event in late mid mid April called Day on the Ride, which is kind of a practice run for everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, the cyclists can come out and ride. We do it in our major markets, and it's the first time our staff is all working in the roles. They'll be on the ride. Our roadies come out, and so we get to practice being in concert with each other. Yeah. Um, we really start in January with training this year. We took what we usually do the week before the ride with our own staff and we broke it into sessions that we parsed and kind of ramped up in a just in time fashion. For example, um, instead of talking about our emergency plan, the Monday before we're on site at um, the Cow Palace, we had a training on our emergency plan a week before our first day on the ride event Mm -hmm. so that we could have knowledge of that, practice that, et cetera. Um, And so, and some of the information that we do training folks throughout can become repetitive on purpose because there are things that we just want to make sure people know and understand. Um, So with our staff, we did a lot of training in advance. We train them on their teams, what they're doing, what their objectives are, because on the ride, they're doing something different than they do the rest of the year. We don't have a safety and rest stop closure team. (laughs) 365 days a year, right? Um, so that happens. And with our key roadies, our roadie captains, so we have about 65 roadie teams. Those roadie teams range from the sweep team to sag bus team to people who are serving food, each rest stop. So we have four rest stops each day. And rest stop one is the same team every day, rest stop two, rest mm-hmm. stop three. Our water team, 
water and ice, I should say, pack up um, gear and tents. Like it, it goes on and on. Yeah. Those captains have a monthly meeting starting in January that then get to different topics, whether it is the camp and it's based on if you're a route based team or a camp based team. So the camp based teams, you know, they start off by going through what are the camps? What are any changes to camps this year? Um, getting any new captains up to speed, things like that. So there's monthly meetings that happen for them. I, what I love is, I've you know, I've been to a lot of different events, the runs, the rides, the hikes, cycling events. And it is too often the volunteers are finding out what their roles are maybe the day before. Likely the morning of you're having the volunteer meeting where you're trying to explain people what to do. And that's what I love hearing. It's the the practice. It's the, you know, or, you know, I think in a national event series, it's going to other events so that you mm -hmm. can prep before you're exactly. the lead on your event. And I just think that to me, if, even if I had a, you know, traditional 5k walk in a park in my community, what I just took away from what you said one of them is the importance of training and prepping your volunteers and your staff so that the first time that they're doing what they need to be doing on event day is not on event day. Yeah. Our stakes are high, you know, yeah. in the cause cycling space. And, you know, everything, everything can be, has an element of danger, right? Cause cycling space has a very high element of danger. Yeah. The risk, the, the stakes are high and we get once a year to get it right. Yep. So we have to make sure that when we get on site, we hit the ground running um, and and all is good. Now, there's another element to this, the staff question, which is, but what does the staff do the rest of the year and how are we engaging staff throughout the year? So in August, we will have our annual staff retreat. It's in Los Angeles this year. We go back and forth between LA and San Francisco. And that is really a two-day meeting where we will recap. We'll go through our annual report. We do an annual report every year that recaps the event. It's like 70 pages of data. <laughs> I live, I live, I, would I love live. It. I mean, mwah. Um, Marcy, I'll have to show you our annual you'll report. You'll have sometime. to send me the <laughs> annual report. <laughs> I mean, you'll sit down with a glass of wine and oh, pour over the pour data. Over it. Um, yeah. It, it basically provides comparative historical data on every data point you could think of. So we'll go through that and um, we'll go through the goals for this next year, which we launch on August 1st. So we will already be open for business, but you know, timing is what it is. We, we do what we can when we can. So, um, and then we'll do use, you know, train folks and tools and actually have them build business plans within each small work group for how we're going to get to a successful uh, June of 2023, 2024, um, yeah. this coming year. So that's, that's kind of the starting point of the staff. And um, yeah, another thing that we do, and, you know, again, we have a, this unique event. We're not all in the same place. We're divided between SoCal and NorCal. And I think one of the great gifts to me, not everybody loves this, was uh, the invention of Zoom and uh, how we used it during um, the lockdown days. But we continue to use Zoom on a weekly basis to have, we have a 30 minute staff meeting every Tuesday that is really about FaceTime with the whole team because mm -hmm. the whole team doesn't exist in the same space. Um, and Tuesdays are, everybody has to be in the office on Tuesdays. Um, most people are in the office more days than that, but um, this is a time when we get to see each other. And um, we used that time this year as part of our training leading up to the ride. We had a lot of new folks on staff this year. So we ended every meeting with a five minutes of the more you know question. And the more you know question was ranged from what's your favorite snack that makes you feel better? And we captured that information so that in the command center the whole week of the ride, we could make sure we had everybody's favorite snack. Love it. To um, veteran staff people, what is the one thing you wish you had known before you arrived on your first AIDS life cycle? To a, a multitude of other things, what will help make getting set up in camp each day easier for staff person? What's the first thing you should do when you get to camp? Um, yes, people camp in tents yeah. <laughs> the whole week. So that I think one of the things with AIDS Life Cycle and every new staff person is the same. You you can't tell a new staff person what AIDS Life Cycle will be like until they get there. Oh, yeah. um, you can tell them. 
but they can't know. And so we did as much as possible to help ease people into this really intense eight day experience with really long days and sleeping in tents and maybe not getting a shower. <laughs> like there's, it, and always in motion. So I love it. Well, you clearly take care of the community and take care of your staff really, really well. And I think that's so important. Tracy, I knew you and I could probably talk for hours and hours and hours. Um, uh, uh, and I so love it. Um, so my last question is, you know, if people are inspired and want to learn more about getting involved with AIDS Lifecycle, where can we send them? Well, AIDSLifecycle.org, of course. Um, AIDSLifecycle.org is our website. And uh, yeah, go there. There's a lot of great info. Um, and the other thing is, if you're really curious about our event, I would recommend going to the AIDS Lifecycle channel on YouTube and checking out um, AIDS Lifecycle 2023. There's a fantastic 16 minute uh, long recap video of this year's ride, and it will give you a little bit of insight into the sassiness, the silliness, and the love that this community has for each other. Well, you are sassy and silly. So I love um, getting to spend the last 30, 45 minutes with you and hearing all your great wisdom. And we will link all of that in the show notes. So Tracy, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Marcy. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. All right. Y'all tune in next time. The P2P Soapbox is produced in partnership with True Story FM, engineering by Pete Wright. Music this week is by Oliver Michael. If your podcast app allows ratings and reviews, we hope you'll consider doing just that for our show. But the best thing that you can do to support the P2P Soapbox is simply to share the show with a friend or colleague. Thank you for listening.